I'm going to go ahead and get started since it's seven o'clock. Good evening, everyone. My name is Beth Bartoletti, and I'm one of the directors of International College Counselors. And I'd like to welcome you to our webinar tonight. It is one of a series of webinars that we're offering that relate to college selection and application. We're offering them every other Wednesday at seven o'clock on a regular basis on a variety of topics. So to give you an idea of my background, I've now been in the profession for 22 years, which is hard to believe. Uh, 14 of those years were spent at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. It's long been known as one of the most intellectual colleges in the country, but perhaps most famously or more famously, it's known as the college where Steve Jobs spent a semester before leaving on for better things. And after Reed, I moved back to South Florida, where I'm from, and I worked at American Heritage School in Plantation in their upper school. I was a college advisor slash guidance counselor there for three years. And then in the last five years, I have been working as an independent uh, college counselor. Tonight, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about liberal arts colleges and the power that they give to the students who attend them. Um, international college counselors, to give you an idea of what we do, we're a team of people like me who have all sorts of experience in education, and we help students with everything related to the college admission process, everything that you see on your screen here, um, from planning and guidance in high school in terms of the classes you should take, refinement of your extracurricular activities, how to spend your summers constructively, and then when the time comes to work on your actual applications, we help you with everything from clarifying confusing questions that the colleges might ask, um, developing essay ideas, all the way down to editing those essays and helping you put your best foot forward. Um, so that's us. So when it comes to liberal arts colleges, they are small schools that make a big impact or are making a big impact in the world. And you'll see as I move on, one of the last slides that I talk about is um, their, uh, the prevalence of liberal arts graduates in high, um, highly visible uh, roles and jobs um, out there. So, Moving on, what exactly is a liberal arts college? Um, it has nothing to do with politics. Sometimes people think, um, in fact, when I worked at Reed and was standing behind a table at a college fair, uh, sometimes students or parents would come up to me and say, um, well, I might go to a liberal arts college, but my family is rather conservative. And in this case, liberal has nothing to do with, um, with politics or political affiliation. It stems from the Latin words um, liberalis artes, which basically means that it's appropriate for free persons, or as in the case of the source I found this in, it said free men, because of course that's who was free then, um, in, in a sense. Um, it's a course of study that's essential for, or that was, they felt essential for free citizens of Greece and Rome that emphasized civic duty and the development of the whole person and not uh, the vocational or technical training, which was um, reserved essentially for, um, or I should say liberal arts were reserved for the free men and the other, the trades, the technical, the vocational sorts of trades were um, reserved for the non-free people, i.e. the slaves. Um, at a current, at a, a contemporary liberal arts college, uh, the classes focus on a breadth of disciplines, everything from the humanities, which includes things like literature, Latin American studies, gender studies, philosophy, um, et cetera, to the arts, the sciences, and math. Sometimes people think liberal arts just doesn't include STEM, but that's a misnomer. It, it absolutely includes STEM and the social sciences. And where are the uh, liberal arts colleges located? Well, there are several hundred of them in the US and they are all over the place. But as you can see, they're more represented in on the uh, East Coast 
and not so many in the central states, but more on the west coast. And one of those four out there in Oregon is the one that I worked for for 14 years. So some main differences between liberal arts colleges and universities. So a liberal arts college primarily offers and invests in undergraduate studies and undergraduate students. So how does that benefit a student? Well, their relationship with their professors it uh, actually leads to a better academic experience and better rec uh, letters, rec uh, recommendation letters for uh, graduate school. The liberal arts colleges tend to have, or will have, not tend to have, a lower number of students, a smaller student body. Uh, your typical liberal arts college has about 2,000 to 2,500 students. Some have more, maybe 4,000 students but I would say in general, maybe 25 is the average, 2,500. Reed had 1,400, our average class size was 14. So with those smaller class sizes, you actually have discussion-based classes as opposed to lecture-based classes, which again means more easy access to the professors and fewer TAs. Now for any students or parents who haven't been to a traditional university, TAs are teaching assistants or GAs, graduate assistants, and those are graduate students who are being paid to, as part of their graduate studies or to help fund their graduate studies to uh, teach generally the introduction, the intro uh, sections to a particular um, subject area like biology or math or um, uh, psychology. So the professor wouldn't necessarily teach those entry-level classes or those freshman intro classes. It's often a TA is teaching those classes, but at a liberal arts college, there aren't any graduate students, and that benefits the undergraduate students in many ways, which you'll begin to see as I talk more. So other advantages of a liberal arts college, as I mentioned, the focus is on undergraduates and the professor's priority is teaching, not research, not publish, not publications. Um, many of them have chosen consciously to work in a liberal arts college or to teach at a liberal arts college because of the lessened pressure to um, make research their first priority. Not that they're not doing research, they're often quite um, involved in research and bring their undergraduate students along with them on those research projects, but they are not under um, the kind of pressure that you often see at a university to publish, to get their name in journals, to increase the, um, the visibility of the university. And as I also mentioned, these smaller discussion-based classes equal a tight-knit community. I remember, now I went to two universities. I started at one, which was a large state university, and I transferred to a medium-sized university. And when I started at the large state university, um, we didn't have any discussion-based classes. My freshman biology class had probably a thousand people in it. And then even my smaller classes had several hundred so that when you went to class, you filed in and everybody took their seat and stared straight ahead and waited for the professor to come in and give us the hour long um, spiel. And uh, then everybody got up and filed out. And for the most part, people didn't really talk to each other. And uh, that is not what happens at a liberal arts college. When you are in discussion-based classes, you get to know each other's names. You get to know what each other thinks about um, certain discussion and debate ideas that are being thrown around. Your professor knows you, they know you by name. So it's a, a valuable um, experience. As I said, students uh, for number three, students are personally known to professors. They um, can call you by name. Um, you're, you're not a number, you're a real person to them. And it also means that professors are evaluating and critiquing your work much more closely and serving as a mentor to you in a way that doesn't tend to happen at a larger university. 
Uh, number four, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, easier access to research opportunities. So at a liberal arts college, I think sometimes people think that they're uh, that research is not happening, but it is absolutely happening. And because there are no graduate students to assist the professors with their research or in their labs or in their, um, you know, it could be petri dish or poetry um, type of research, they turn to the undergraduate students. Those students become their research assistants. They're, they don't have to wait in line literally or figuratively behind graduate students to have access to those professors or to the facilities. Um, at Reed, for instance, we have the, we have, I still talk like I work there, they have the only nuclear reactor in the country that is staffed by undergraduates. It's a nuclear reactor. You do have to go through a year-long training uh, program separate from your academics, but as an undergraduate student, you can become certified as a nuclear reactor operator. So those are the kinds of opportunities that exist for students at liberal arts colleges. It's also easier to get involved in extracurriculars, at least I would think so, given that in a large state university, my experience was that I was a little too intimidated to do the things I had done in high school, like um, run for student government or uh, work on the newspaper, because I just sort of felt like, well, I'm sort of nobody, nobody knows who I am. I'm just a lowly freshman. Whereas when I got to my smaller university that had 6,000 undergrads versus, um, I think it was like 25,000 at, at the place where I started, um, I did feel like, okay, it's a small enough um, community that I do feel comfortable walking up to the guy who's the editor of the paper and asking him how to get involved or um, working at the radio station. In fact, I heard about the job in one of my classes. They announced it and I ran right over and, and um, ended up getting a job at the campus radio station, which was perfect because I was a public relations major. So the communications piece on the newspaper and at the radio station were right up my alley. Also more opportunities for leadership because again, there's less competition and it's easier to talk to the president, um, to talk to the director of student activities, to talk to the director of residence life, for instance, to come to them with ideas for things that you think might make fun traditions or should be a different way or a more fun way of doing things and getting more people involved. We had a tradition at Reed called um, Nitrogen Day, and it was always seven days before the last day of classes in the spring. And it was always the seventh annual Nitrogen Day because it, nitrogen is the seventh element on the periodic table. And uh, that was actually started by somebody who still worked at Reed at, um, in the registrar's office later, but he had started it back in the 80s. And here it was when I was there, um, you know. 20 years later and they were still doing it because Ben had had this idea and it was kind of silly and ridiculous and um, but but intellectual at the same time and so uh, you know that's still a tradition and that was something that a student brought to the campus. Another piece to be aware of is the fact that liberal arts colleges can be very generous with financial aid whether that's coming from need-based aid or merit-based aid Sometimes it can actually be cheaper with scholarships or other monies that you are able to get from the college um, than it would be to, for instance, attend another university. Um, liberal arts colleges also tend to boast better graduation rates. If you think about the fact that you're um, not a number, that people care about you, people notice you when you're not in class, et cetera, um, classes aren't as impacted. It's, it's less likely that you'll not be able to get the classes you need to graduate in four years, that the graduation rates are in fact better in many cases um, at liberal arts colleges. And I'll show you some slides um, in a little bit that um, show you evidence of that. So I already mentioned the discussion-based uh, classes and just a little more about those. The, uh, the classes are taught in the Socratic method, which is obviously named after uh, the Greek philosopher Socrates. 
It's a question and dialogue format. Um, it stimulates critical thinking and challenges students to support their arguments. It emphasizes discussion and debate. And it's very different from that passive learning that happens when you, as I mentioned, file into the classroom, sit in the balcony of the auditorium, and you know, can't even see your professor without a set of binoculars, which literally was, was my, my situation um, at the State University. Um, the professor in these uh, Socratic seminar discussion um, based classes is acting as a facilitator. So he or she is keeping the discussion moving, um, throwing out um, provocative questions, asking students perhaps to clarify, but allowing the students to speak to in each other. They're not just talking to the professor, they're talking to each other. So somebody who might disagree with person, you know, person B disagrees with person A, but they need to be able to um, uh, crystallize their thinking, their thought process, and be able to articulate those thoughts um, to the uh, person with whom they're having that discussion. And the next slide talks a little bit more about that. So as you can see in the last item, uh, liberal arts colleges challenge their students to think outside the box and propose innovative ideas and interesting discussion. Again, that is not something you get with a lecture-based class. So liberal arts colleges are trying to provide you or do provide you with the widest breadth the widest breadth of knowledge and the skills that are most often sought after by employers, which include critical thinking, communication, analysis, teamwork, and problem solving. They don't train you for a specific job. They train you to succeed in any job. They train you with a, or they prepare you, I should say, not train you. Um, they prepare you with a very broad foundation such that you can succeed in any job. And I'll talk about that um, more specifically in a moment. Um, but you can, for instance, take your career in a, wide direct, in, in a wide variety of directions after you graduate. So there was a Reed uh, alumnus who I met once when I was traveling for Reed and he had majored in biology at Reed. But he was also um, a very talented pianist. So for a while, he was a classical pianist. And then he decided, I really like to cook. So he became a well-regarded chef. And then after a while, I guess his interest in food and food prep and all of those things led to him um, working in a, not working, he founded a company that prepared frozen food, uh, that food at which was then frozen and shipped. I don't think this was a number of years ago, so I don't think it was you know any of the the places that you know the um, food delivery options that that we have now. But um, I thought that was such an inter interesting trajectory for him to go from biology to piano to chef to then he said he took what he learned in his biology classes and as with his biology major to um, help him with all the processes he had to learn about freezing food and maintaining its quality. And I believe actually by the time I met him, he had retired and he was probably in his 40s because I think he sold the company and, and so he was quite successful. Another um, piece that sometimes people miss about liberal arts colleges is that they are very strong in the math, the math in mathematics and in sciences. Uh, sometimes I think people just think, oh, liberal arts, but they forget that that's just sort of a shortened term for liberal arts and sciences. So I wanted to show you this slide, which actually I lifted off Reed's website, which is why Reed is bold in bold in, in the chart. Um, the, this chart shows the undergraduate origins of PhDs. Um, I think it was from 2012 to 2018. Sorry, the dates aren't there. But you can see that in the life sciences, the first two columns on the left, um, we've got Reed, Swarthmore, Carlton, Grinnell, Haverford, Harvey Mudd, and Pomona. So that is one, two, three three, four, five, six, seven um, colleges in the top 10 that are liberal arts colleges 
um, that produce future PhDs in the life sciences. And then in the physical sciences, I believe there are six. We've got Reed, Harvey Mudd, Carlton, Swarthmore, Haverford, Wabash, and Grinnell. Uh, actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So seven again. I had actually miscounted that at the beginning uh, when I was doing this. But you can also see that they are great, liberal arts colleges are great um, places to start for students who are looking to go into, um, you know, who want to pursue a PhD because you can see the other um, psychology, other social sciences and humanities are also up there with um, uh, in, the, in the rankings. So when somebody says to me, what can I do with a liberal arts degree? I say, anything you want. And just to give you some evidence, I'm gonna show you a few notable alumni from liberal arts colleges. You can see these yourself. Um, some of these are names that are known to you, maybe others aren't, like Vivian Schiller, the CEO of NPR, um, came from Middlebury. Michael Eisner, who used to be the CEO of Disney, and Steve Carell, we all know and love Steve Carell, Denison, John Stewart, College of William and Mary, etc. So we have uh, represented here Sarah Lawrence, Franklin and Marshall, Wellesley, also of course Hillary Clinton famously attended Wellesley, Gabby Giffords went to Scripps, and the founder and CEO of Netflix went to Bowdoin. I think a lot of people sometimes wonder how you say Bowdoin. The O is silent in Bowdoin. And the next slide has more um, notable alumni. So CEO of Home Depot, um, everybody knows uh, Meryl Streep, of course. She went to Vassar, Burger King, Denison. I, I wonder if um, Denison actually has a um, Burger King in their food court. They must. Uh, the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald went to Haverford. Uh, we have Ben and Jerry's represented um, by Oberlin. Uh, Johnny Carson, for the older generation among us, maybe, and hopefully the kids know who he is. Uh, he went to Millsaps, which is in Mississippi, and of course, George Steinbrenner went to Williams. So this is very a very abbreviated list, but I just wanted to, sh I mean, you look at the different careers that everybody um, on these lists went into, um, but notably a lot of them are founders and CEOs or uh, very, you know, very successful in their fields. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the liberal arts um, program or the liberal arts themselves are um, a practical education for a shifting global economy. They teach what the employers are looking for. They teach those, I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure I would call them soft skills, but they're certainly ne necessary skills. Uh, communication skills, analytical skills, the ability to work in a team, technical skills, and a strong work ethic. And you can see too, the average starting salary is not terrific, it's not bad, um, but it's, um, it, it, it's, there's, I'll show you a slide at the end of the, the um, webinar that points out that it's a slow start for the first 10 years, but then it multiplies um, in a major way uh, at when you're um, older and you've been in your career for a number of years. So next slide. So despite the STEM push by governments and teachers and guidance counselors or whomever is pushing you, uh, the liberal arts are actually incredibly effective at teaching students how to develop those soft skills or not so soft skills, such as creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, and more that are highly valued by employers today. And they can open the doors to a wide range of jobs. So let's look at those individually. Uh, creativity, ability to research, communication, critical thinking. Now I didn't list teamwork here, but teamwork is certainly um, a large component of uh, success in today's um, business world. So uh, I think just by being um, in touch with and learning how to get along with people that you disagree with in a discussion-based class, or you know, getting along with somebody who's working in a lab with you, uh, 
um, at, uh, you know, you're working with your, your professor from biology or your professor from anthropology, that you need to learn how to work in a team. But when it comes to creativity, as I mentioned, liberal arts grads are um, educated or encouraged to think outside the box. And employers need employees who can view issues from various angles to come up with the best solution. So fluid thinking is uh, a plus, being practiced in it is a plus. And ability to research. So students are uh, at these colleges are taught to gather information to support their views. So it's not enough to say, I feel thus and such, or I think thus and such, you have to back it up with evidence. So they are um, familiar with conducting research, understanding biases, listening to information given to them by um, any sort of um, constituent or a consumer, a coworker, or superiors um, with, you know, they're working very closely with their uh, professor on a paper, let's say. Um, they have to work very closely with people and they have to learn to listen carefully. So once they have that information, once they've gathered the information that's relevant to whatever it is they're working on, they have the communication skills, the speaking skills, the, as I mentioned before, the ability to crystallize their thinking and articulate that either on paper or um, in, a, in a speaking uh, sort of presentation. Uh, for communication, uh, communication obviously keeps companies from falling apart. So a large part of a liberal arts education is um, writing papers, um, delivering presentations, um, writing critiques about other people's published papers. Uh, so they practice those skills. Um, and I remember one of the students that was an intern in our office at Reed. She talked about how, and she was an A student. Actually, I was one of the student, uh, one of the readers of her file. She was a straight A student in an IB program at a school in California. And she, she said when she got her first paper returned to her, you know, she thought she was a great writer. And she was a strong writer. Not, you know, I'm not going to take anything away from her. But um, when she got her first paper returned to her, she said it was covered in red. And she was like, oh my gosh. But what they were doing was saying, okay, you, yes, you're a good writer, but we can make you an even better writer. And we're going to do that. We're going to not let you slide. And oh yeah, that's, that, that works. That's, you know, enough. Um, they're always going to be challenging you to improve yourself. And then the last piece, the critical thinking piece, it's a highly thought, excuse me, a highly sought after skill. Um, in today's world, we need critical thinkers. Um, you have to be able to sift through information. You have to be able to connect dots, draw conclusions, draw connections, piece together puzzles, and assume various stances. Um, all of these things are needed in the world of business. Other reasons that employers want to hire liberal arts graduates, because while science can teach us how to build things, it's the humanities that teach us what to build and why. Without those skills, the technical skills are of limited use. So instead of just, we're not gonna just throw something, some building up because we know how to build it. We need to figure out why are we building this and um, what needs to be built in this space. A little bit more evidence. Um, the president of Microsoft and the executive vice president of AI and research at Microsoft wrote in their 2018 book, and he's using um, artificial intelligence as the um, guinea pig here, if you will. So it's not enough that we know how AI or artificial intelligence works. We need to be able to guide that artificial intelligence such that when these decision-making um, capabilities are handed over to technology, that there's a human component to those. We need to be able to guide those, um, that, that turning over of that power um, carefully. Um, we need to, tech companies need to work with governments and academia to determine the best ways to overcome the potential dangers inherent 
of handing over aspects of our lives um, to computers that mimic human thought. And while tech companies will know more about how technology works, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that those same people, those same employees will know best how artificial intelligence should be used in ways that are society, uh, societally responsible and beneficial. So things to keep in mind, it's not just, again, back to the previous slide, it's not just about, um, you know, building the building or building the software or coding the software or whatever it might be. It's about what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And keeping those sorts of human components in mind. But if you're thinking, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not necessarily um, sure whether I want to attend a liberal arts college because I do want that technical piece. You don't necessarily have to choose. That's the good news. Um, there are several liberal arts colleges out there that offer degrees in engineering specifically. Um, I listed them here, Bucknell, Harvey Mudd, Lafayette, Smith, which is an all women's college, and Swarthmore are a couple of the colleges that offer engineering as part of the um, liberal arts experience. So it's just seamlessly, uh, it's a major at any of these schools, just like math would be a major or economics would be a major or philosophy would be a major. So you take your liberal arts um, as part of your, your um, you know, foundation, and then the engineering is your major. It, if someone else is majoring in um, uh, language, Russian, uh, then they would take their liberal arts foundation, and then they would study Russian and Russian literature. Same idea. And there are other liberal arts colleges that offer what they call three, two or dual degree programs. Now I, I um, put in engineering, computer science and forestry and environmental science. Those are just a couple examples. The most popular three, two programs are engineering and a couple of the popular uh, partner institutions are Duke, Columbia, Dartmouth, Penn State, Georgia Tech and WashU and St. Louis. So the three two program means you spend three years at the liberal arts college and typically in that junior year you apply to the partner institution. So you apply to Duke or you apply to Columbia or you apply to RPI Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute um, as a person who is going to finish that three two program at that partner institution. So Reed used to when I was there have a partnership with um, Columbia, Caltech, and um, I believe it was Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in engineering. Um, and they had a partnership with the University of Washington um, with computer science. Um, it doesn't look like they offer the computer science one anymore, but there are other uh, liberal arts colleges that do offer computer science in a 3-2 program. And, um, Duke actually offers the uh, forestry environmental science two year piece. So if somebody wants to do that, but they want the liberal arts background, uh, that is most often sought after at Duke. So you don't have to decide. You get the best of both worlds. So if that's not enough um, evidence, I'd like to take a look at outcomes from liberal arts colleges. Uh, although liberal arts colleges educate about three to four percent of U.S. college graduates, the alumni of liberal arts colleges account for 27 percent of all U.S. presidents. They're also responsible for educating 20 percent of Pulitzer Prize winners from 1960 to 1998 and one in 12 of the nation's wealthiest CEOs. And uh, so these are small colleges making a large impact or small numbers with a big impact. So only 4% on this uh, slide, as you can see, are represented as liberal arts alumni, and yet they've produced 9% of Fortune 500 CEOs, 23% of US educated Nobel laureates, and two uh, liberal arts colleges are in the top 10 of uh, the top 10 US colleges. Uh, and those two are um, who have produced uh, Nobel laureates. 
and those two are Swarthmore and Amherst. As I mentioned, 27% of US presidents and then 14% uh, of Harvard uh, tenured law professors. So now I'd like to revisit the graduation rate that I mentioned earlier. Um, note at the heading of this slide that the national average graduation rate in four years is only 33%. Now we're including all universities in this, in this number. Um, so everything from not for-profit colleges, but uh, you know, everything across the spectrum, but it is pretty low. Um, so persistence can be a problem in terms of finishing that degree. And notice that the schools that I have listed on this slide are not liberal arts colleges, but they are what are often, um, some of them, not all of them, are uh, thought of as public ivies like the University of Virginia and the University of Michigan and Berkeley and uh, UT Austin. And then I threw in some Florida schools because I'm, we're here in Florida. Um, but just to give you an idea of the percentage of students graduating in four years. Now these percentages go up significantly if you stretch it out to six years. But as I used to say uh, in my information sessions for Reed, um, six years of time, you know, time spent in school means two extra years of tuition and fees for the parents. So looking at this figure, you want to be almost guaranteed that I can finish in four years if that's what I want, if that's the plan. My brother was an engineering major. It was a five-year plan. I mean, consciously, that's, they, they needed to spend five years doing that. Um, but if it's, you know, I'm planning to go in and spend four years and then move on to um, graduate school or do whatever I'm going to do, liberal arts colleges are going to be a better, um, a better bet. So take a look at these. Notice that the highest um, graduation rate from one of the public Ivies is 88%. And if we move to the next slide, I selected some top tier liberal arts colleges on the East Coast and look at their graduation rates. Uh, we've got 90, 91, 89. I put them in order of, um, of uh, you know, highest to lowest. But also look at their admit rates. So a lot of times people will say about liberal arts colleges, I've never heard of this school. And when I worked at American Heritage, we used to correct the students because that sounds a little a little rude to say to a college admission uh, rep, I've never heard of your school. So we taught them or tried to teach them to say, I'm not familiar with Bowdoin College. Could you please tell me more about it? Um, but please look at those admit rates. These are top tier schools. These are not, um, you know, anybody can get in sorts of schools. Uh, you may not have heard of them or you may not be familiar with them, but these are elite top tier institutions um, that do a fabulous job with their students. And I want you to familiarize yourself with these names on the East Coast, and I've got some on the West Coast and in the Central US as well. So if we look at the West Coast, we're looking at Claremont McKenna, which is part of the, um, the oh my gosh, the, um, the Claremont Consortium. How could I forget that? Claremont McKenna. Um, also part of that consortium are um, Harvey Mudd, Scripps, which is all women, Pomona and Pitzer. They're all on my list here. They all are part of a large campus and you can do cross registration among them, um, but they all have their own sort of personality and area of specialization. But I want you to notice their admit rates are you know, they're not in the single digits, but they're close. Well, Pomona is, and Deep Springs. Now, Deep Springs is certainly one that a lot of people have not heard of or are not familiar with. Deep Springs is an all-men school. It's very small. It is, it's a very interesting um, uh, experience. I want to say it has like 25 students, 
They, there's no graduation rate there because it only offers the Associate of Arts degree, but the students are enormously talented and enormously sought after when they finish at Deep Springs. And oh, I forgot to mention it's free, um, or at least it was. Uh, I didn't, I forgot to check that fact um, before, but uh, 10 years ago it was free. So hopefully it still is. But they are, anybody from Deep Springs who's graduating from there can practically have their ticket written for them uh, to an Ivy League or other top tier liberal arts colleges. Um, one of the other interesting things about Deep Springs is that the students all serve as the admission committee for the next class coming in. So it's a very interesting experiment, uh, not experiment, experience. And I encourage you if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, it's in California. Um, so check that out. And then in the central US, not as populous a place for liberal arts colleges, but there are still notable colleges there. Um, you can see their graduation rates are up there also with uh, you know, the top liberal arts colleges elsewhere. And uh, just some schools, again, that you may not be familiar with. Carleton is in Minnesota. Colorado is obviously in Colorado. Kenyon is in Ohio. McAllister in Minnesota and Oberlin is also in Ohio. There are also a number of colleges, 45 to be specific, uh, that aren't necessarily listed on the slides I just showed you. But these are colleges, what they call colleges that change lives. And you can find the website at ctcl.org. Now, Reed is one of the colleges that changes lives. And this group, this consortium, came out of a book that was written in 1996 by Lauren Pope, who, the late Lauren Pope, who was a, in his day, the education editor of the New York Times. And when he retired from the New York Times, he decided to become a college advisor. And he used to tell families all the time that, um, there are other options out there besides these, you know, Ivy League schools. And the parents were saying, tell me what they are, please, please give us a list, give us a list. So finally, in 1996, he put together a tentative list and then he visited all the schools that, that went on the first list. Um, it's increased. I think there used to be maybe 36 schools. Now there's 45 with the second edition of the book. But um, he had this tentative list and then he visited all the schools basically undercover and he spoke to everybody he could at these colleges the students the faculty the staff the janitors the groundskeepers um, more students alumni etc and he determined that these were colleges that weren't necessarily so selective that they were taking only the best and only the brightest but, student, but colleges that weren't nearly as selective, but were doing great things with their students during their time there. And their explanation for it, or their, the analogy they used was if we measured hospitals by the quality of um, health of the patients coming in, that wouldn't make any sense. It's the quality of the health of the patients when they leave. Um, so this was something that he thought would be great. So anyway, there's a book out there, there's a website, there's a whole consortium, and I encourage you to check these out because these are often unknown colleges that you're not going to be familiar with, but they do a tremendous job with their students. And perhaps on an even more practical note, if you go to a liberal arts college, you'll make more money. So let me, that was um, a recent, uh, practically last month, five weeks ago, um, article in um, uh, Forbes. Now this slide I took, this graphic I took from a different source. Um, it came from the Georgetown University Center on Education and uh, in the workforce. That's right, I couldn't read it. Um, but it shows that, as I said, a liberal arts college, so at the 10-year mark, as I mentioned earlier, 
the median is going to be 62,000 for a student. Whereas if we're looking at all institutions, it's 107. But at the 40 year mark, so at the point when you're in your early 60s and perhaps getting ready to retire, the return on your investment is more than $900,000 as opposed to all other colleges where you're looking at $723,000. So even more close to, but still more than, those are four year engineering and technical related schools. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that there will always be a demand in business for people who are good commun communicators, problem solvers, and free thinkers. So I encourage you to consider a liberal arts college. Now, if you have any questions, I'll go to the, the list of questions. So feel free to add questions um, if you have them. I'm also going to... Um, look at, okay, what, uh, oh, also wanted to tell you that if you have any questions about what I, uh, what I was talking about tonight or any questions about needing help in the, um, with the college admission process for yourself, for your friends, for your granddaughter, for your um, son or daughter, I'd be happy to help you. <clears throat> you can see my contact information there on the screen. I've been to I've been to a number of colleges. I've visited a number of these, um, and uh, I can can tell you certainly about them. Let's see. I've got a question coming up. Will you send us the slides? Yes. If you are on the the webinar, we will be sending the slides and the the webinar to the participants, and also to anybody who signed up but was not able to join us tonight. Uh, let's see, I have some other questions here. Um, let's see, oh, I already answered the one about uh, political um, affiliation um, and about uh, what about engineering? Can I do engineering at a liberal arts college? Oh, someone asked, um, what do liberal arts colleges look for in uh, their applicants? So it's really no different from what a regular college would look at, well, I shouldn't say that. I should, generally speaking, yes, they're certainly looking for strong preparation in uh, high school in terms of the rigorous coursework you take, um, strong grades, strong writing, et cetera. Some universities don't even ask for an essay, so they really don't have an idea of how your um, writing abilities are. Um, but I would say the same is, is um, true in terms of, their, as one of my colleagues put it, colleges are looking for great students, great meaning a good GPA, um, uh, oh my gosh, I put rigor is the R, E is extracurriculars, A is your attitude and all about me, sort of who you are character wise. And T is the test, the, the tests. Um, although a lot of the schools, especially the CTCL schools, the colleges that change lives, have gone to tests optional. So that's another uh, point to consider. But I would say that the liberal arts colleges being smaller and recruiting a smaller class naturally get fewer applications, relatively speaking, relative to their size, but that allows them to do a more holistic read of the file than um, a college, a larger college would, where it's sometimes literally just your GPA and your test scores that they're looking at. Okay, I had another question coming up. Let's see. Um, yes, yeah, so actually this was another question. Thank you. Um, if a student is interested in a medical career or doctor, what path would they take at a liberal arts college? Again, back to the anything you want. Um, whether you're going to a liberal arts college or a traditional university, you can major in anything you want to. What you want to make sure of is that you take the classes that are typically considered prerequisites for medical school, which includes organic chemistry, regular chemistry, physics, calculus, uh, biology, naturally biology. I think sometimes people think that you have to major in biology if you're going to medical school, but I attended a panel at Reed that was, um, it was medical school admission personnel who came from the medical school 
uh, at Oregon Health Sciences University to speak to our students. And one of the panelists said, if you major in biology, you will be completely bored in, in medical school because you'll be doing more biology. So you can major in religion, philosophy, math, um, English, whatever you want to, as long as you get those prerequisites that I mentioned. So pre-med in and of itself is not a major. It is uh, an advising path, if you will. It is how do I use my electives such that I will be um, a, an attractive candidate for medical school. But I looked up in anticipation of this question, I looked up the colleges that, or, or colleges that are most frequently attended liberal arts colleges before medical school, or that most often send uh, graduates to medical school, and it included Williams, Amherst, Swarthmore, Wellesley, Bowdoin, Carleton, Middlebury, and Pomona. Uh, so, you know, again, back to the uh, small class sizes, the ability to engage in research with your professor or professors, the ability to get meaningful, um, substantial, substantive uh, letters of recommendation from your professors, I think, make a world of difference when you're considering uh, medical school. So any other questions? I don't see any other questions. I appreciate so much your time spent with me. Oh. Oh, somebody said thank you. So <laughs> you're welcome. I enjoyed um, pre presenting to you tonight, telling you what I know about liberal arts colleges and why they can be the best place for your student. And hope that you'll get in touch if you have other questions about liberal arts colleges or applying to college in general. Thank you for your time and have a great evening.